Ta-da. Huzzah! Okay, so we're in business, uh, and we will be even more in business when I put us into projector mode. Great. Okay, so what I want to talk about today is challenges of deploying things into the Internet. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about goes somewhat beyond the, the usual preoccupation with the technology. I'm really concerned with the economics and the policy aspects of trying to get things out there into the, uh, into the world, into the marketplace. Now, uh, b before I go too far in, I should start off with a couple of the usual caveats. Uh, like many of my uh, government colleagues, you'll note a, a great big disclaimer at the bottom. I'm speaking for myself. Uh, and one other point that I'd like to make up front is that you know, what I'm talking about uh, is maybe a more activist role, but it certainly isn't about regulating the Internet. So keep cool. Keep cool, gang. Okay. Now, for me, I was uh, particularly motivated to look at a set of issues uh, in part because of the work that I do that relates to cybersecurity. I am a member of the Homeland Security Policy Council for the FCC. Uh, it's been an interest of mine over the years. And um, not long ago, uh, the President's office, the White House, was concerned with creating a national strategy to secure cyberspace. And there were a couple of features that they identified as being um, important ones to keep an eye on. And one of these was enhancements to DNS security, and another was BGP, both operational kind of processes and also uh, things more like secure BGP. They, they kind of flagged those as issues. There's a third where I think they were perhaps a little off the mark and where they realized later that they were a bit off the mark, uh, and that is that they also identified IPv6, which I think most of us would recognize as tangentially related to security, but security probably isn't the reason why you'd implement v6. So there are these capabilities. All of these in various forms have been slow to deploy into the market. And that got me thinking. And it actually got me thinking about a few other things that in various ways have been slow to deploy into the market. Differentiated service has been fine within a network, but across providers has been slow to deploy into the market. One might even make the same point about multicast. Now, one could argue, you know, maybe not all of these are great things, but some of them are probably good things. And um, the, the natural question is, why is it that this particular bunch of features seems to have been, well, maybe not stalled, but moving at a glacial pace, a slow pace. You know, what, what's the deal here? What are the elements of commonalities? What is this telling us? And from that, I really toss out a couple of thought questions, and these are largely the things I'm going to be working on in the course of the presentation. Uh, first one, of course, might common factors be at work here among these various capabilities? Uh, the second one, uh, and again, we start reaching pretty quickly into the area of economics rather than technology, is are market forces enough to drive these things into widespread deployment? Uh, are they enough in general to ensure that vital enhancements happen? <clears throat> and if not, is it possible to correctly identify some important things that wouldn't happen on their own and try to find targeted ways to provide help to them? And, and as I emphasize the word correctly. Are we smart enough to get that right? Which is not a rhetorical question. Um, now, having said all that, what kinds of public policy initiatives might be available to foster deployment of things that might not get going on their own? Uh, what are the costs and benefits? What are the prospects of success for uh, that kind of intervention? You know, these are basically the questions that I'm looking to pose today, and, and uh, I'll be, I think, throwing out more questions than answers, but in, in a way I'm trying to start some dialogues both in this community and also within government itself. Now. There's a lot of underlying economic theory to this. Uh, in particular, there's one notion of public goods. And this is from economist.com. It's a fairly technical definition of public goods are. But they're things like, for example, the national defense system. And a national defense system is such that the country has to have it. It benefits everybody. Uh, if, if it weren't supported through taxes, it would be hard to get people to pay for it because if I don't pay for it, I know that my neighbor probably has to. There's not enough penalties for slacking. Uh, it's a classic economic problem. Uh, and as a result, services like this, usually government plays some role in ensuring that they're provided. Now, there are several documents that I'm going to be drawing on in the discussion that follows. And a couple of them are quite new documents. Uh, one is a report from the NTIA, which is a unit of the Department of Commerce. Uh, they recently completed a draft study, not a final, uh, on IPv6 at both the technical and e economic level. 
meanwhile, a, a second paper that came out is from the NIAC. The NIAC is the, network, uh, the National Infrastructure Advisory Council. It's actually an advisory council to the president. It operates under Homeland Security auspices. Uh, I'll also be quoting some work from a paper that I have coming out in the journal, and maybe a good illustration of the degree to which I've come out with the dark side is uh, it's showing up in a law journal. So I guess I've retreaded myself a bit. Okay, now let, let's talk a little about market forces. Uh, so basically, what are the economic incentives to the people that have to make investments in order to get these things out? Uh, are the economic incentives sufficient to motivate people to do the things that are needed? Uh, are they aligned? That is, do the, uh, do the benefits from those investments flow back to the people who make the investments? Are, the, are those benefits quantifiable? If you're going to do a business case, they better be quantifiable. Uh, and do they come back in a reasonable time frame? Uh, two other topics I'm going to be touching on are the economics of network externalities and also the relationship between the end-to-end -end principle and something that economists call transaction costs. So let's talk about economic incentives. Well, again, with many of the features that we're talking about, if we ask ourselves who pays, is it the end user, is it the service provider? A lot of cases it's the service provider. Who benefits? In many cases, it's really the society at whole, as a whole. It's not necessarily the individual provider that gets the benefits. Think about something like DNSSEC. Does the individual provider actually get the benefits, or is it everybody? You know, basically, if the parties that have to put the dough in don't see where they're going to get dough out, it, it's hard to move the thing forward. Uh, a third issue has to do, once again, with quantifiability and uh, time frames. Uh, if there's a long payback period, Again, even a prudent business may not be motivated to make the investments. It's just too speculative. It's just too problematic. Uh, you remember uh, Louis Quinze, or maybe it was his mistress, Madame de Pompidour, saying, "Après moi le déluge, after me the flood." You know, basically, uh, let the future worry about itself. It's far enough out. Maybe it just won't happen while it's on my watch. You know, so all of these things sort of militate against immediate action. Now, in terms of the business case, I'd say one of the things that particularly galvanized me to start doing work in this area, and that kind of, in a, in a way, really is the event that led to the, uh, to the paper that provides the basis for what I'm saying today, uh, was a talk I gave to the ISP Working Group. And this was basically a team of very good representatives from the industry that Richard Clark and his colleagues assembled uh, back in 2001 as part of the process of creating the, uh, the national strategy to secure cyberspace. And I, I had the opportunity to speak to them for a few minutes, and I said, well, you know, guys, if you have trouble getting business plans together that your management will buy into, then please let us know. We think this is important. And everybody kind of looked around at each other embarrassed, and then one person sort of timidly puts up his hand and basically says, you know, Scott, you don't have to wait a year for this. We already know the answer. Everything in these reports has been known for years. There's nothing new here. If we had been able to craft business cases that our management would go with, it would have been done a long time ago. So um, I take that as a data point. It's one data point. The single swallow doth not a summer make, but it's a data point. Um, and I, I think it becomes important to focus on the economics of these issues. Now, a number of people have looked at this. And as I said, there are different reasons why a number of different threads are coming together in the government right now. Uh, with the NTIA, which is part of the Department of Commerce, uh, on their study of IPv6, they made this rather nice but perhaps sort of heavily e economic assessment that underinvestment occurs because conditions exist that prevent firms from fully realizing or appropriating the benefits created by their investments. In other words, if a company can't get the full benefit of the money it puts in, it'll tend to underinvest. If it doesn't know where the money's coming out, it won't put enough money in. Now, another major area is the economics of network externalities. And there's an extensive theory on this. In fact, a lot of the theory was developed by a guy who used to be at Bell Labs, Jeff Rolfs. He's a wonderful economist. Uh, I gave you the title of a recent book he did, Bandwagon Effects in High Technology Industries. It's a great little book. It's a fine read. You don't have to be an economist to get a lot out of it. It's a good book. It's a great way to understand these problems. So basically, in a, in a network industry, there are some features that are worth a lot more as more people use them. Telephones are worth more 
as more people use them. Every time somebody in Montana who didn't previously have a telephone buys a telephone, it makes my telephone in Washington more valuable because there's one more person I can call. The more people that have email service, the more valuable email is to everybody, modulo the spammers. So, um, so that's what network externalities are about. Now, what this theory also tells us, though, is that the optimal value for the society is to get big, big, big rollout. You want everybody to have the stuff. And in fact, most of these systems have many potentially stable equilibria. They could settle in at a much lower level than the societally optimal one. And so the question is, how do you get a new technology past the initial adoption hump? How do you get it to the point where it has critical mass? And it turns out, historically, different industries have met this problem in different ways. Um, for example, with the telephone, uh, one of the mechanisms that was used is something called universal service. It's cross-subsidies to rural areas to make sure that the poor and those that are a long way from a cent central office for the phone system still get service. For VCRs, part of what happened was that there already were a lot of machines out there for time shifting of television programs. That's what created the preconditions that made it possible for the real industry, a VCR rental industry, to take off. As a third example with CD players, the way that it happened was that there were vertical integration of industries. The same companies like Philips and Matsushita that made players also had relationships with studios so they could get the profits on both sides of the market. So again, it's been different in different places. Uh, as a last example, in the case of black and white TV, probably one of the biggest factors is that the industry and the government very quickly converged on, on standards and the standards were acceptable and workable. And well, sort of let me skip through this again and, and another Department of Commerce uh, economic statement about uh, the relevance of externalities, in this case to IPv6. Now, let's talk to the end-to-end -end principle because it's yet another thing that I think plays into this mix. And I think plays into the mix for all of the features that we were talking about in that second slide a while back. And again, you know, in, in this room I don't have to dwell on the technology. Everybody knows this stuff. Um, it's guiding principle of internet architecture. It goes back a long way. Sort of the, the, the seminal paper is really the Clark, Salzer, and Reed paper from MIT in the early 1980s. And this has been an important feature. You know, part of what it says is that there's some things that are best and most appropriately implemented in end systems. And it's kind of a corollary to that. It's made it easy to add new features at the application level because they only touch the edges of the network. They don't touch the core. We know that we've had a similar beneficial principle down at the data link layer, which is you can add new data link types, Wi-Fi, let's say, to an existing network structure without perturbing or disrupting the rest of the network infrastructure. So it's been easy to add certain kinds of things to the internet. That's been one of its great strengths. The question here would be, you know, what about new capabilities that don't fit that mold? Now, for example, a service like IPv6 goes to the network layer and isn't so easy to introduce just between a pair of consenting adults. Uh, many of the other features that we're talking about really relate, again, to, uh, to core kind of facilities that require a lot of entities to participate. And those are going to be tougher. Requirements for interoperability and upward compatibility are more complex. The effect of the network externalities are, are greater. Again, this notion that you don't have much value until almost everybody is deployed. But last but not least, the fact that you've got many players and sort of long value chains means that you'll tend to have high economic transaction costs. Now, transaction costs is kind of an interesting term out of economics. Um, if you buy a house, you know what you're paying for the house. You get a mortgage, let's say, you know what your monthly payment is on the mortgage. But, well, how many people here have bought a house in the last five years? Show of hands? Okay, so a lot of people know what, what I'm about to say. When you do that, you end up maybe paying points, you end up paying a brokerage fee if you're selling, uh, you end up paying a title company, you end up getting nickel and dimed with a lot of different things. Those are transaction costs. If the transaction costs get high enough, a transaction may not take place. And so the suggestion here is that there's a whole class of potential upgrades to the internet that are held up or, or that are slow to deploy, at least in part because they tend to have high transaction costs because you need to get concurrence from such a large number of participants. They're not just pairwise like, like the original implementation of the World Wide Web. 
Now, I'm going to talk about a couple of specific vulnerabilities, a couple of specific features here, um, but I'm really not going to dwell on the technology. First, the technology really isn't my point, and second, there's lots of people here that are much more current and much more knowledgeable uh, on the details of the technologies than I. Uh, just think of it as I'm, I'm painting a little bit of a gestalt here to, to show you where I'm coming from. So, again, let's talk about the domain name, and uh, particularly about uh, capabilities like DNSSEC. Well, we know the vulnerabilities. I mean, aside from denial of service attacks, you've got the basic fact that you really don't know who's answering back in an unsecured DNS query. You don't know that the data is good. You don't know that it hasn't been corrupted on the fly. You don't know that it was good even in the server that sent it to you in the first place. So this has been known for a long time. And that's why you've had different kinds of solutions that have emerged to try to, to address it. Uh, two notable ones uh, are TSIG and uh, RFC 2535 DNSSEC. Now, TSIG is designed for kind of a more point mission, a more limited mission. You've got secret key cryptography. You're getting a cryptographic hash or checksum. It authenticates the sending system and verifies transmission integrity. So it does a certain job, a rather narrow job, but it does that narrow job well. It's not necessarily scalable to the whole world. It doesn't solve every problem. It doesn't chill your beer. But what it does, it does. Uh, you look conversely at a system like DNSSEC, which is a very beautiful, elegant, comprehensive system. Now, you know, we, we know there's been evolution in the system. We know things like delegation signer and little details, but honestly, that's below the level of detail I'm interested in talking to today. The, the point is you've got a very comprehensive, elegant system, mostly workable, um, deals with a much wider range of problems. The reality today is that TSIG, while it's a point solution, it's used for a limited number of things, things like zone transfers, but it's used. You know, most people would say that it's usable, deployable today for what it's good for. And conversely, with DNSSEC, um, we've seen a long road. I mean, I, uh, last night at the, at the workshop, I saw not all that many hands go up for people that are putting it in in the near term. Uh, you know, clearly there's progress. And I very much applaud the progress, both on the technical front and on the deployment front. But this is one of those features where there are real challenges, where it's slow going. Uh, and my content, and, and in fact, by the way, uh, the uh, Ed Lewis RFC 3130, I think, made very clearly the point that, uh, that the deployment has been viewed as difficult and, and, and as immature. You know, so this has been a tougher go. And my contention would be that, that uh, excuse me, my contention would be that it's largely the same issues. That here, instead of having a pairwise process that can be done between consenting adults, you've got a lot more players, higher transaction costs, many of the same factors that make it hard to get these things out into the field. Internet protocol. Again, I'll try to, to sort of whiz through this. I think this is familiar to everyone. But you'll recall, early 90s, addresses running out, chicken little. Um, and because of that, uh, an accelerated effort to develop new standards for an expanded address space. And a few other things got tossed in at the same time. IPsec support, QoS support, configuration ease. Now, what happened? Well, on the address front, we know what happened. Um, this is the way that an address usage graph would have looked up until about 1991, exponential growth. The addresses did indeed look like they were about to exhaust. Uh, the slide I'm about to put out actually is the same slide that I put up at Nanog a couple of years ago when I was with Aaron. And what it shows is that subsequently, uh, due to what you could really view as a rationing system put in place by the RIRs, and a successful one, uh, you now have a negative second derivative. Uh, the rate of growth is slowed to the point where it's much less of an issue, where there's not an immediate threat of, uh, of exhaustion. So as a result, that driver went away. Right? So on the address side, the registries were successful in checking the growth. As a result, you got a not compelling economic case today, I would argue. If you look at the other stuff, IPSEC, QoS, you know, again, you get you know, maybe some arguments for deployment, but not a compelling economic case today. So again, these seem to fall into the category of things that, because a lot of players have to interact, it's hard to get them out there. And indeed, there are a lot of players. If you think about IPv6, it impacts equipment manufacturers, many of whom have already done this work, by the way, end systems, PC operating systems, DNS servers, uh, the RIRs themselves. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of moving parts in a system like this. Lots of moving parts implies high transaction costs. High transaction costs means difficult to get the thing rolling down the shoot. And also, the benefits of migration tend to be limited until you've got a lot of people that have done it. 
Nothing succeeds like success. So this is why I believe this whole class of capability tends to be hard to get deployed. Now, that does inevitably raise the question, is there a role for some benevolent, well, hey, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, right? But, you know, is, is there a role for somebody to try to get the process moving? And that's a lot of what I was actually writing the paper on. Now, I think it's an area that needs to be dealt with with great care. Uh, it's clear that government could do too little, and I would argue perhaps today it's doing too little. The, the, the mantra that one should never regulate the internet, I think, may be taken with a little much too re religious fervor. It's also clear you could do a lot of damage by doing too much. And so uh, really trying to find sensible balance points, I think, is an enormous challenge for the years ahead. Um, to me, the, the two operative principles should be first, you know, keeping a balance on what the costs of inaction versus the costs of inaction are, and second, trying to approach things where action seems appropriate in a minimalist way, trying to do the least that would get you where you're going, and bearing in mind uh, Thoreau's admonition that that government that governs least governs best. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about in this part of the presentation is alternative forms of intervention, um, the NTIA consultation on V6, the NIAC report on best practices, and a couple of quick case studies. And I'll just try to keep moving along here. Um, let's see, do I, do I have a few extra minutes since yeah, we started a few minutes late? You do. You have uh, five minutes. Okay. Okay, so what are things that government can do? Well, we can help industry to reach consensus. This is kind of the bully pulpit model of uh, government's role. Uh, we can collect relevant data, collect statistics provide seed money for research and for interoperability testing. Now, this doesn't look very much like regulation at all. These aren't the things that people tend to worry about. Uh, government could support desired services through its own purchasing preferences. Uh, there are a few other things that could be done under tort law, even under insurance arrangements, to try to alter the playing field of costs and benefits. These are more complex and they're perhaps a little more risky. Uh, finally, at the extreme, you could imagine government actually mandating certain things and funding them, as, for example, we do with CALEA, with wiretapping, uh, a rather mixed experience, I would add. Okay, so again, on coalescing consensus, the bully pulpit's been used for a long time. It's a good thing. Um, and also the fact that uh, government, by pulling together industry, in most cases, enables competing companies to discuss things that they might be uncomfortable discussing by themselves because they'd be worried about antitrust concerns. Generally, government presence mitigates those concerns. So again, government can play a very constructive role in these. Um, as far as getting industry together, there are a number of ways that we do that. We have the various forms that operate on an ongoing basis. If you look at the public consultation that the NTI did on IPv6, that's probably a pretty good example of government soliciting input from a lot of different corners of the industry. Uh, FCC has a Network Reliability and Interoperability Council. The Department of Homeland Security is the sponsor of this Presidential Advisory Committee, the NIAC, the National Infrastructure Advisory Council. So these are probably good examples of the way that government does that. Data collection, data sharing, uh, one of the biggest challenges is being able to keep the data private. Now, as far as IPv6, the folks at Commerce looked at the problem pretty hard and they came away feeling that there is not a market failure, there's not a need for, for government intervention, heavy intervention. They did see a need or an opportunity perhaps for government to focus on things like research funding, ensuring human resources, that there's people who understand IPv6, and also test beds and interoperability. They felt that these were areas where government might play a constructive role. And yet, at the same time, they felt very strongly, let me skip ahead here, that industry should continue to take the lead in developing the IPv6 standards infrastructure. Skipping ahead, they're saying government should be a major consumer of v6 products and services, but should not mandate adoption by industry or by government agencies in the United States. Private sector decisions should be, should be market driven. So again, you see sort of a very delicate balance, a, a, a government role, but industry leadership. Now, NIAC looked at very much the same issues, and they look at it in a broader context. NIAC doesn't just deal with the internet, even though the internet's plenty big. I mean, they deal with everything down to water supply, air transport, all kinds of critical infrastructures, financial infrastructures, you name it. And here, a very general statement they make, and it's very clearly worded, and this is one where there was probably blood on the floor when they were drafting this thing, so you know, it's, it was crafted with, I believe, great care. 
and they, they say, I'm going to take a moment to read this one, where market forces are free to operate, they will be the most efficient and efficacious vehicle to enhance the security posture of critical infrastructures. However, some suggest that the pace of change may be too slow and the response may be incomplete. If market forces prove unable to operate efficiently and quickly, government should consider timely intervention, but only where there's a good characterization of the potential harm that could occur. Okay. So that's the statement. This is actually industry talking to government. It's an advisory council to the president. And they actually outline that, uh, that framework. Basically, uh, they're saying that where government needs to operate, it should operate with circumspection. And they also provide a common framework on how to look at these things. Are there dependencies in the sector? Do security concerns prompt customers to switch? In other words, do market forces operate here to encourage the, the providers to do the right thing? A bunch of other considerations, well-written report. I'm not going to try to duplicate it here in just a few minutes. It's worth a read. Also, they say, if government needs to act, pay attention to things. Don't do unfended mandates. Um, ensure that there's alignment at the federal, state, and local levels, and so on and so on. I, I just amass good advice here about how an intervention could be done where it's needed. But they also come around and say, in the case of the, of the Internet, they think that a regulatory intervention is premature. They basically say the systems are working well enough. Bear in mind, though, there's a lot of interventions short of outright regulation that could have effect. And they talk about a number of them, everything from tax credits, research and development subsidies, procurement leverage, enforcing the laws, um, a wide range of options for government really to play a constructive role. Funding more security research to better understand cyber threats and uh, the way that the IT sector can defend against them. Insurance, liability, tax incentives. So th this is a range of things that NIAC has recommended, even in the internet, where they say that a regulatory response might be inappropriate. Now, there's a new NIAC report that came out just last week. I participated in the working group. It's called Hardening the Internet. Uh, I think the report isn't online yet, but it should be momentarily. Uh, there's one recommendation I wanted to flag to this group that's also very relevant to the same themes. Uh, and in fact, in presenting it to the full NIAC, the full Presidential Advisory Council, uh, George Conradis, who was the group chair, uh, strongly recommended that if the group were going to do one, this should be the one. It was basically to sponsor research into how people make their decisions about what features to deploy, I'm trying to understand better how these deployment decisions actually come out. Okay, so let's talk a little bit, and, and this is my last few slides. I'll be uh, wrapping up in a second. Um, Let's talk a little about case studies of government interventions. Now, to me, uh, there are happy case studies and there are not so happy case studies. There are case studies sort of like Daedalus, uh, the Greek mythological figure with the wax wings who flies away and gets out of jail. And there's also some that look more like Icarus, which is his son who flew, flew too close to the sun, melted his wax wings, and fell into the sea. And we seem to have some of both. Um, on the Daedalus side, uh, I would argue that a lot of the initiatives that created the very internet that we're talking about today were government initiatives of exactly this type. Government funding and sponsorship of the ARPANET. Government funding a couple hundred million bucks for the NSFnet. Uh, one that is often forgotten is the funding for Berkeley Unix, BSD Unix, to put a, a TCP kernel uh, into the publicly available version of Unix, which percolated then into bazillions of workstations in the 1980s and created the network externalities that made the network take off. So basically, those initiatives and, and others like them played an absolutely critical role in creating the Internet that we know today. Now, there have been others that I think are a little less happy. Uh, how many people here remember gossip? How many people want to remember gossip? Uh, I didn't ask it that way, actually. But partly, I, I, I know not, not, not everybody has hair as gray as mine. So OK. Uh, it, this was uh, a 1988, 1990, and a little later kind of initiative. Uh, the set of detailed OSI protocols uh, were being pushed around the world by a great many governments uh, with gossip. The U.S. government standardized on these OSI protocols, and they said uh, if you're going to acquire networking equipment or capabilities, they have to be capable of doing gossip. You don't have to use gossip, but the capability has to be there. And it generated probably a lot of waste motion 
uh, and a lot of wasted expense over a period of many years, and, and perhaps a lot of confusion. Ultimately, again, we have a network externality story. A lot more TCP IP was sold. It went out in the marketplace. OSI became irrelevant. And ultimately, these procurement standards were dropped. So a relatively unsuccessful use of government leverage, and maybe also a dramatic illustration of betting on the wrong horse, uh, which is a key factor here too, right? You've got to watch out for regulatory hubris, for pride. Um, there's a risk that government will make bad decisions. Uh, another example is uh, metric conversion, and you know, not exactly in our field, but I think it's a good example. Uh, if you go back to 1971, the National Bureau of Standards published, or published a report saying that metric should be the predominant, if not exclusive, uh, method of measurement in the United States within 10 years. Uh, there was a Metric Conversion Act of 1975. There was an executive order issued in 1991. Today we're in 2004. How many people would say that metric is the predominant system of measurement in the United States today? I don't see any hands. So, um, in this case, almost everything short of an outright draconian mandate was attempted. Um, because there was the use of the purchasing power of the government. There were educational initiatives. There was a lot of this stuff. Nothing short of an outright mandate actually achieved the desired effect. Whether, the, whether that was the right thing to do is a separate question. Whether the desired effect was really that desirable, you could argue, I think, either way. But, um, but the point is that there's not a guarantee that government intervention will suffice in any of these cases. And there's also the risk that he'll bet on the wrong side. Okay, which brings me back really to, to my closing and, and my couple of themes. Again, that you need to approach these things, I think, and we in government need to approach these things with a sense of balance, a sober recognition of what the costs are of action, the costs of inaction, uh, and where we think that it's necessary for us to play more of a role to do a minimalist role, to try to do the least that could possibly have the desired effect. And with that, I'd be delighted to take questions. I think I have a few minutes, Bill. Scott, I was curious if there's a, uh, a V6 gossip uh, going on right now. Uh, a, a mandate, in other words, to have V6? Well, not exactly, but at one level you could argue that there is. As you're probably aware, the Department of Defense uh, has made uh, IPv6 mandatory for their procurements. Now, in that case, it may actually make a lot of sense for them. Some of those networks are either somewhat closed or fully closed. Uh, they probably have a lot more control over their end systems than the average commercial organization. Uh, and it, it could well be that even though the purchasing power of the government isn't, I think, enough to tip the system, uh, it may create a larger installed base within the United States that might help to create some of the externalities that help us to get to a tipping point. Uh, next question. A a any questions about the FCC other than Spectrum or Howard Stern? Sinclair. I think we're it. Thank you, Scott.